Thank you, Martin. And uh, I want to thank Dennis Bailey for giving me this opportunity. He uh, knew I had done some work in this area and called and asked if I would be willing to, or, and I jumped at the opportunity. Um, so I was looking at my uh, book collection today in preparation for this, and I realized that I started reading Faulkner about 28 years ago. Uh, and the first book was, I, start, I got the recommendation from an English professor to start with a uh, manageable Faulkner work. I think, I still think As I Lay Dying is the most manageable of his works. We'll talk a little bit about that, but to give you a bit of an overview, I want to talk about a little bit about Faulkner's background. I don't want to psychologize him too much or um, uh, talk about that, his growth and development. That, that he's, he's certainly much more than that, although there's a lot to be said there. And then I want to suggest that if you read this book or if you read Faulkner to approach this from the point of view of your own personal relationship with the material, because it, Faulkner says if you want to read about relationships with other people, read the Russian novelist. If you want to learn about yourself, read Faulkner. And so it, uh, and in, in relationship to the, everybody says, well, it's so difficult. It can't be good literature if it's that difficult. I think that um, this is, this, again, this is the most accessible work. After I finished this, uh, the next one I read was Sound and the Fury. And any of you who know that work, uh, I would throw it down and uh, eventually had to go get cliff notes to understand it. But um, when asked about that, Faulkner said that if you don't understand it the first time, read it again, and if you don't, then read it again. I would suggest if you haven't read The Sound of the Fury, read it first without reading about it and see if you can kind of figure it out. Uh, and then you'll understand better later if you read about how he approached it. So uh, Faulkner uh, dropped out of high school and um, in Oxford, Mississippi, never finished high school, enrolled at Ole Miss, dropped out of Ole Miss, you probably know that story. All the time he had showed promise as a writer, uh, certainly didn't show much promise as a student. Uh, he was born in the late 1800s and um, so around the time of, of World War I, he would have been um, certainly eligible for the war. He was rejected by the U.S. Army because he was too short. He was only about 5'2", but he really wanted to be a pilot, so he went to the Royal Air Force in Canada, joined and uh, learned to fly. About the time he was getting his wings, the war ended. That did not stop him. He um, pulled a little bit of a Brian Jennings, I guess, and came back to Oxford, uh, had his Royal Air Force uniform, and had uh, developed a war injury and a limp, and told stories that that fact were completely fabricated that he had been in combat and when in fact he hadn't. Um, he was known as Count No Count around Oxford for a number of years and they really were not very proud of him until he won a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1952 or so. Um, as, as most of you know if you're Faulkner fans he uh, restored a wonderful house there that's right on the edge of town, very close to, to Ole Miss. Ole Miss now owns and operates that house. Uh, the material I got said he bought it for, I think, $6,000, and um, it was in pretty bad shape. So from his background, he was a insecure, um, the, the value of biography here, I think, is to reassure all of us that uh, everybody has to overcome things. He had to overcome quite a lot. Um, he was a disciplined writer. He said, if you want to, the writers write. If you want to learn how to write, you've got to put the time in. He, he was less disciplined with his use of alcohol. Um, when asked what one should be afraid of, he said, the police, uh, women, and yourself. So pretty good advice. Uh, he, uh, he, did, he supposedly did not drink when he was writing, but he was clearly a pretty, pretty severe alcoholic. Died in a alcohol um, hospital there outside Jackson uh, of a heart attack around age 62. Um, so a little bit about his background. I think that if you read these books, you can't help but uh, 
look at your own life and development of that. I have shared with you a little bit of that in, in terms of my own relationship. Although I did not, the only book I read in high school was, or actually a short story was The Bear, which appealed to me because it was about hunting. For those of you that have read that, uh, that's the story that has the longest sentence uh, known to man in it without any punctuation. But um, the, the, the thing that sticks with me, I guess, about film, movies, books, is that if you, if you keep, um, thinking about a character long after the book is over, or about emphasis in the book, uh, I think it, that's what, how you know it's good literature. And, and when I first read Faulkner, as I said, I'd been encouraged to by uh, a, an English professor, and uh, I didn't know how, and how much it would appeal to me, but it did appeal to me a great deal. And one of the reasons was that I kept when I read this book, I said, well, I, I know Anne's Mundren. I see him every week, either in disability evaluations or jail. or I mean, you'll see the, the characters that are, uh, James Franco, the casting in this is just superb. I think he, he knew the book well. He is a uh, devotee. He's finishing his PhD in literature at Yale. I don't know where he is in that process, but I, I think this film would certainly qualify for a uh, at least a master's thesis, if not the dissertation project, but uh, I think he did an excellent job with it, particularly in casting. Um, the novel itself is 15 characters, uh, interior monologue, so that what you have in the different chapters are, are just that he drops you in the river of the stream of consciousness, which is his technique of writing and you have the perspective from those 15 different characters. The main and the most frequently occurring character is the son named Darl, D-A-R-L, played in the movie by James Franco. Possibly, uh, the, I guess, the, a more interesting character in some ways is Jewel, who has only two monologues in the book, and you'll see him, he's the one that's training the horse, perfectly cast, I think, uh, he, he captured, uh, he also directed this with a, a fellow doctoral student from Yale. Um, and there, uh, there's another brother, Cash, uh, who's the good workman. He's a little obsessive compulsive. Um, and by the way, the way we use this book in, in medical residency was kind of like we've used balance seminars. And that's kind of a concept that's unique to family medicine. but. The ballot seminars are based on the work of a, a primary care physician who was retrained as a psychiatrist and worked with a group of about 15 primary care doctors and they had an ongoing seminar in which they would staff cases and talk about the really the neurotic or the psychosomatic aspects of medical care and the impact that the physician could have on the relationship. And so the, the, the balance seminars fit r r very well in use of film or literature to kind of step back from the, the exam room and look at why am I reacting to Anne's Bundren so uh, negatively or why, why, you know, somebody that evokes a positive uh, reaction or a negative reaction. So it, it fits real well. That, those are the things that I wrote about and I appreciate having the opportunity to share some of that with you. It, uh, it really was a hobby to me, but it had a lot of personal significance as I went forward. And I think that if it hits with you, it'll hit with you and you, you'll study it and go back to it and read it more closely. And uh, I got as interested probably in the literary criticism aspect of it as I did the, um, the work itself at, at some point after I had worked through that, which is, is pretty interesting. The, um, Faulkner is the third most published author in the English language behind God and um, Shakespeare. So, of course, the Bible comes in there. And despite the fact that he dropped out of school um, so early, he read very, it's like a 10-year internship with a lawyer there, a Yale-trained lawyer in, in Oxford who was a mentor, who had him read very deep in classic literature um, and 
current literature, and uh, also he, he left Oxford, went to New Orleans, and went to Europe for a while, was there uh, with, with Hemingway, with Sartre, with a lot of other contemporary writers. So the, 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 the way in which he writes was very new at the time. James Joyce wrote this way. Any, any of you that have tried to read Ulysses, you know that it's a uh, novel that's probably 350 pages long, and it's only one day in the life of uh, this fellow over in, in Dublin, and, and it's, it somehow stretches um, that one day into that much writing. I, I've, I've never been able to get through Ulysses, but, <clears throat> but it, uh, that's the the height, I guess, of the stream of consciousness technique. When asked about where he learned to do that, he said, I'm just telling stories. So he never would really acknowledge the influence of, of some of these folks. And he, it was, you know, certainly he had to be influenced by Freud, by William James, um, certainly by Joyce. And there's no question because their, their writing is too similar. And, uh, the whole basis of what we do in psychology today is, is really stems from the work of William James, I think, and is the stream of consciousness technique, because where we separate from Freud is Freud was looking at the same stream of consciousness ideas, but he attached a particular model to it. That model was, as you know, a psychoanalytic conception of how, where behavior comes from, uh, with the id and the superego and the conflict there between those things. We know now that that doesn't really fit very well, but what he did was he, he opened the door to the royal road to consciousness, and Freud uh, certainly laid the groundwork, Faulkner followed, and he just wrote stories. Now, some interesting work I, I came across that's been done by uh, a lady who grew up in that part of the world, his country, so they speak, so they say, and uh, she's found evidence that he went up, he spent a lot of time in, at a friend's house in Holly Springs, and he kept meticulous notes about, um, they, they kept diaries, much like Jefferson did, and they, he studied those diaries. Now he was 18, 19, 20, uh, so it's not like he just popped up at, in 1929 being a great novelist. He worked very hard for at least 10 years, and some people look like overnight successes. Usually there's a lot of preparation that's gone into it. So he didn't graduate, but he read long and hard and deep for about a decade, um, published two novels. One was came out of New Orleans called Soldier's Pay during his time there. The second was Sartoris, and then in 1929 he uh, broke out and wrote The Sound of the Fury, which, which took all of that year to write, and he wrote and rewrote. He describes that as The Sound of the Fury, of course, is the story of Caddy Thompson, who's not, who never appears as a contributor to the book, but the book's about her, which is interesting. And he, he wrote the first chapter and said That's, that wasn't good enough, so he wrote the second chapter. The first chapter was from the point of view of a mentally retarded uh, man in the Thompson family. The second was from a Harvard student, Benji's brother named Quentin, who ends up committing suicide at, 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 up at Harvard. And uh, the third from a kind of sociopathic brother by the name of Jason Thompson. And, it, and those are all told in the point of view of the stream of consciousness. And then the final chapter he, is his contribution as author, but he tells the story through the eyes of the family uh, maid, a uh, woman named Dilsey Gibson, who's the person that has the most character and, and influence in the book. Uh, but he said it still fell short. So. Um, it, it's been written about a lot that he, he said he still didn't capture it. Now, the thing about stream of consciousness is that he says that words do not really capture the, or, words are never enough. And to capture the unique richness of human, human experience, that we try with words, but it's never quite enough. So. He, that's why it's so frustrating to read, is he doesn't tell you this is what I'm about to do. He just drops you in the middle of it. 
This apparently appealed to James Franco. He said he first read this book in high school and kept going back to it. Um, so if you, like me, I avoided it in high school. I was doing other things. Um, but I went back to it and found that um, a very close reading then provided, at the time, what I said was just escape and good stress management. So I, I got interested in it. and. Uh, that, that's where the writing came from, but we found a, a, a good use for it, I think. So, uh, as we watch this, think about, uh, you, you'll recognize some of the characters because they're from uh, other really good movies. And so, um, James Franco, I think, did an excellent job. And um, I don't know how he's, I know he's, he's, he won some smaller awards for directing and adaptation of a novel, um, but some of the, um, the, the literature and the richness of it is, is really pretty amazing. You don't really get that necessarily in the film, so I would encourage you to, to um, read the books. And uh, without uh, saying a lot more, I've given you a lot of material. There's some, uh, I would also tell you about William Faulkner on the web, which is an Ole Miss uh, website that has lots and lots more. Uh, before we start, I think we're, we're just going to go home and do other things when it's over. So, it, does anybody have a question ahead of time or anything they want to say or uh, note about it? If not, we'll, I think you're in for a treat. I, I was really curious to see how he did this because it, it seemed to me that it's one of those, it's like, uh, I know Salinger you know, wouldn't be interviewed just like Harper Lee, but, but um, Salander said he would never let them have Holden to, because it would ruin it for, you know, all the people that do their own work connecting to Catcher in the Rye. Uh, you know, that's, that's how we bring our own history, our own self to literature. And it's, it's a lot better that way. However, I have to say, I never could imagine how he could have done these different monologues and put it into the story arc of a complete, uh, that completes that novel, which is a great story, as you will see. But, um, but he does. He does it using a split screen technology, which is, is really a good vehicle for it. And Faulkner, in this book, is the first time he mentioned his fictional county, which is really Lafayette County or Oxford, Mississippi, but it's Yachna Patalfa County, which is an Indian name, uh, which uh, a lot like the county I grew up in, which is Scambia County, and where there are lots of creeks, both people and small bodies of water. And uh, that was one of the reasons that I identified with it so much. And um, I think that what I would say is see how you identify. But the real thing that got me was I kept saying, uh, I saw Anne's, the father here, probably more than any other character, which is kind of, as you get to know him, you'll say that's kind of sad. But um, he had a, a, like a heat stroke at 22 and he said, if I sweat, I will die. So he spent the rest of his life avoiding work and he, <laughs> Uh, it, 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 they, they point that out in a lot of different ways. So um, anyway, let's, let's take, have a look at it and see and go from there, but thank you.